All right, let's do this. Hello, and welcome to As It Comes, Life from a Musician's Point of View. I'm Davina. I'm a freelance cellist based in London, and I'm super excited to bring you this first episode. In this podcast, I'm going to be chatting with a special guest each episode about life as a musician. Why? Because it's a topic that is lacking in transparency, which is not ideal because it can lead to a feeling of isolation and loneliness in a competitive industry. If you're a musician, how many times have you been asked, what have you been up to, and not been able to answer? Or, if you're not a muso, have you ever wondered about your musician friends? For example, why they tend to be up so late at night, or why you can never catch up with them on the weekend? My aim is to demystify this topic by encouraging my fellow musicians to speak openly about what it is they do, including the peaks, the troughs, and the downright strange things that studying at music college can't prepare you for. And by doing so, I hope to highlight some experiences that might resonate with you and create a sense of solidarity within the musician community. So, a little bit about me first. As I mentioned earlier, I play the cello. That statement still rings true. <laughs> I was born and raised in Auckland, New Zealand, hence the accent, and that's where I did my undergraduate degree. I then moved to Sydney, Australia for my postgrad studies, and this is where I learned how to sharpen my vowels and speak with this inflection in order to be understood. Following that, I moved to London in 2013 to join the Southbank Sinfonia, and I have been here ever since, freelancing with various orchestras, ensembles, teaching, and now podcasting. So now to my first guest, the wonderful Chad Vinden. Chad's a pianist who's a vocal coach and accompanist or collaborative pianist, whichever term you prefer, more on that later, at both the Royal College and Royal Academy of Music. What a guy. We chat about what a vocal coach actually does. I mean, I was in the dark, as well as the responsibilities of an accompanist. We also chat about his biting satirical skills as author of the successful Throwcase blog, as well as how rock climbing can help your practice. Here is my chat with Chad. Thanks for doing this, Chad. Thank you for being here. It's my pleasure. I should really say thank you for having me, actually, because I'm at your flat. We're glad to have you. And yeah. with the promise of food later. Yes. Every yeah. podcaster's greatest dream. You've recently been in Australia. Do you want to yes. tell us a little bit about what brought you there? So I did this concert with a close friend, Morgan Pierce. He's a ba very good Australian baritone. We've actually worked together for about 10 years now. And he got this amazing concert in Adelaide at the Eucaria Centre. And that was great. It's actually the first time I've performed in Australia for a while. When we moved a few years ago, we just sort of launched straight into London's musical life. And I love going back to Australia, but it's hard to organise such a big trip. So this was a great chance. We, we did the concert. It, I thought, went very well. And then we stayed on for a holiday for a few weeks, caught up with friends and family and uh, it was nice to have the sun and the coffee and the wine. And oh, the, tell me about good. it. Yeah. I mean, I was in New Zealand at the same time. You were in Australia, and I think we yes. missed each other by one day yes. in Sydney, infuriatingly. But it's always interesting going back, especially if you've been in the UK for several years, yes. as we have. I think you've been here for seven years. Seven years. And I've been here for six years. And when I go back and I see people who are kind of up and coming and, and studying there, and I don't know anyone anymore... Yeah. It's a really, really strange feeling. You feel quite alien. Yeah. yeah. I did feel as I flew back and saw the London skyline and flew over Greenwich, where we live, it was, my heart surged. I felt suddenly like, oh no, I'm actually f flying home. It does feel now like London is home. Yeah. Yeah. And how was your jet lag coming back? Terrible. Huh? Really terrible. terrible. Yeah. I don't know why this time worse than the others, but something about that <laughs> Uh, sitting on a, on a small cramped seat for 25 hours oh. never gets easier. Yeah. Did you have to go straight back into work? Yes. The very next day I had a concert with the Royal Overseas League. Day after that I was coaching at Academy. Full day. Uh, yeah, launched straight back in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that sounds similar to me. We landed halfway through a Wednesday and then I was teaching the next yeah. morning. And you next sort of morning. you sort of power through, don't yeah. you? 
Yeah, you have to. Yeah, yeah. The work is very capricious. It comes when it comes. Uh, you you know you have to do it. Yeah. Exactly. But you do find those those times when you stop, and then you just think, "Oh my goodness, I just want to go to sleep right now." Yes, yeah. especially towards the end of a busy period, end of a school term or end of a concert, you suddenly find that there must have just been adrenaline powering you through the previous few weeks because suddenly you crash or or you get sick. And your immune system was blocking it before, but mm-hmm. then immediately you, your whole body relaxes. Yeah. Totally. I always get sick during half term. Yep. And I was like, yep. oh, I'm free. I'm going to do all these amazing things. And then, no, no, you're going to stay in bed all week. Yes. As amazing as staying in bed is. It's, <laughs> yes. Yeah. So you mentioned coaching at Academy. Yes. So could you just clarify for listeners what it is exactly that you do? That is a very good question. When I first got the job as a coach, I called my parents to tell them. They were very proud and congratulated me. And then a few seconds passed, they're like, so what is that? (laughs) So I guess outside of the musical world, it's possibly not uh, well known what that is, especially for singers. A singer really needs a team of people to make them into a professional singer, starting with their vocal teacher. They do the the bulk of the work on the actual singing technique but then there's other people involved as well and uh, that's where the vocal coach comes in the singing teacher will be doing vocal technique the coach can basically do everything else i'm interested in vocal coaching in particular what they do because i notice a lot of the time vocal coaches are pianists yes so why is it that they're pianists and not necessarily singers This is another great question. The position of a vocal coach is rather unusual. It's probably the only job, or it must be one of the only jobs, where a non-practitioner is in a position of telling a practitioner what to do. And so it creates an interesting situation. You have to sort of coach them with the interpretation of the text and how it's reflected in the music, Yes, I believe. What is it that makes you an expert in that rather than the singer themselves? Ah, Singers have a really cruel fate. The problem is their instrument is alive it's, and it's inside them, which is unique. We, as a pianist, I don't have that. We have the instrument outside of us. We can hear what we're doing. For a singer, it's, that's biologically impossible. The very mechanism by which you hear, for them, it's attached to the same mechanism with which they make the sound. So just as we've all experienced listening to our recorded voice, we're often surprised by what it sounds like even more so for a singer, what they hear while they're singing is not what the audience hears. And it actually gets slightly more complicated for them. Not only can they not really hear what it is that they're producing, usually the better sounds for the audience are made in a way that to them sounds worse. Yeah, That's possibly the most common experience I have playing for singing lessons is the teacher trying to get them to do something a certain way. They resist for a while until eventually they say, but this can't be it. It sounds awful. And the teacher says, no, it sounds much better that way. So a singer really does have to rely on outside ears to guide them towards what is best for them. So part of your job is to act as the ears yes. for the singer. Yes, exactly. And you have to they have to trust you and you have to be guiding them in a way that is actually helping them. <laughs> You're not going to sabotage the singer. Well, exactly. <laughs> yes. That would just be mean. Yeah. <laughs> You've got to tread very carefully because you are guiding them from an outside point of view, but you must be able to translate that into a way that works for them internally, the way they think, the way they work. A singer needs to know that the technique that they're applying is sounding the way they want, and the only way they can then build on that is to sort of remember how it feels. Sure, yeah, there's that physical interaction between what the intention of the sound that they're putting out and what they're actually doing with their mouths, exactly. I suppose. As a pianist, it's hard to know what this must feel like. And I had an experience recently where I, th- I think it's probably pretty close, is I was playing a concert where I was playing on an electric keyboard that was hooked up to speakers outside in the hall. And so from where I was sitting, I had no idea <laughs> what I sounded like. But I was told, oh, you yeah, know, you sound great out there. But it was the most unnerving experience of my life. Oh, totally. Because yeah. you must feel like absolutely detached. Completely detached and having to rely entirely on someone saying, yeah, no, the volume's fine or whatever. Yeah. That is a singer's lot. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. I never really thought about it like that. And I always just wondered, it's like, why don't you just know? But it's it's hard to know. In yeah. fact, it, it's very it's it's quite cruel because you can almost always 
say that a singer will sing worse if they try to listen to themselves. It starts interfering with the actual technique, which is alien to me. If I'm playing, I'm always listening to myself. Yes. But yeah, they have the almost exact opposite. It's like riding a bike where you, you know, moving the handlebars left steers right. Yeah. And someone's telling you what yes. to do. I guess in a way they're going against instinct. Yes. Very strange. They have to rely on this team, the singing teacher who is a practitioner and knows it inside and out and knows what it's like to sing, hopefully has sung professionally and, and has also figured out how to communicate those that, that knowledge to the singer. Uh, there's no substitute for that. The coach really can't replace that unless they are a professional singer themselves. What they do instead is, is supplement it or complement it in other ways so that there are many ways to shape a singer's understanding of what it is they're doing in a way that helps them do it better. Mm -hmm. And a coach can employ... Uh, many techniques for that. You don't necessarily need to refer to singing technique in order to actually convey something that helps them sing with better technique. There's cool. many things. It's different approaches, Yes, I imagine. Uh, one thing that really interests me is the role of the vocal coach in regards to coaching language. Yes. So how is it that you go about coaching languages that you're not overly <laughs> familiar with? With. That is a good question. Yeah, it it would make sense to think that the only person who's qualified to to teach a language is someone who speaks that language. But in the context of vocal coaching, where basically a singer can bring you any repertoire of any language and you've got to say something helpful about it, there's amazing how many principles of good singing are evident in all the languages and how you can make the singing better by focusing on a few essential principles. Uh, I recently coached someone who was doing a Swedish song and I don't speak Swedish at all, but she was trying so hard to do all of the Swedish that it was getting in the way of the line. It was very good work. She had worked very hard on her yeah. Swedish, uh, but I was able to say my outside ears are hearing that it's actually chopping off the line. Sure. So it's like, I guess, the equivalent of someone enunciating every single yes. word. Yes. and the the message is not going across. Exactly. So you can help with that. Yeah. Basically, there's some principles that always apply. The thing that is vocally more comfortable is usually the thing that is better vocal technique. And so often you can do a lot of good simply by focusing on what's getting in the way. There might be jaw tension, there might be uh, shallow breath, there might not be enough support, there might be over enunciation of consonants, or articulating the consonants in a way that don't help the legato, mm -hmm. uh, that don't help the line come out. That's, that's, a, that's a big one. And you can identify all these things physically, what a singer is doing, if they've got tension in their jaw, yes, things like that. The, especially if you've played for a lot of singers and you've played for a lot of singing lessons and you've, you've seen the nuts and bolts, it's very easy to diagnose certain problems and ideally give a solution that immediately addresses that. And that's when I really always feel that coaching is going very well when you can say, do this. They do it and they immediately are happier and think, oh, that was easier. Like, yes, exactly. I feel better now. Great. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's what you want. Yeah. I am just waiting for the day that you are on staff to coach for a modern opera set in Australia. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> and I'll be the one person in the room who's like, no, it needs a bit more. <laughs> <laughs> you just need to really elongate those diphthongs. Yeah. Yeah. They're not enough diphthongs. Yeah, Australia's. <laughs> We, we really went for the diphthongs, you know, not just one vowel, all of the vowels yeah, yeah, yeah. In, every, in every part. And then you'll have this native Swedish singer being like, but it's uncomfortable. <laughs> Go against your instincts. It sounds great from yes. over here. <laughs> well, uh, in a way, Australian, the, the Australian twang that we have is actually very good for singing. That sort of, it's approaching nas nasal, the sort of ah sound, <laughs> uh, which as an antipode and we're very familiar with. It actually does help a lot in producing uh, blade and cut and various other aspects of the voice. Yeah, the Australians have a good setup. We've been trained well from the way we speak. Can you tell me what blade and cut are? They're those sorts of terms that uh, everyone uses slightly differently. It's, it's a certain way of articulating the sound that doesn't necessarily create more volume but does have... Uh, a cutting power through through other sounds can penetrate yes through other sounds like like an orchestra also i imagine the australian accent has got such a wealth of different sounds whereas you think about particular languages that have very definite vowels mm. right like italian where yes. you basically there aren't any there aren't any diphthongs at all it's it's always pure vowels 
whereas Australian is the opposite. Yeah, that's one way where Australians do have a, a disadvantage when they try to learn Italian. English speakers generally have a disadvantage trying to do Italian in that they tend to put a diphthong in where it, for the Italian it's, it's yeah. alien. I do remember a story from um, an Australian who was on tour in America. It was actually with the Sydney Con Orchestra, yeah. like 2010 or something. And they were hanging out with a whole lot of Americans because we were in New York at the time. And this American guy said, why is it when you say the word no, you manage to fit in all the vowels? <laughs> it's kind of true, it, though, isn't it? It is our talent. If you hear yes. it. Yeah. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> yes. As well as being aware of the sound a singer is producing and the technique that they're using, you also have to accompany them. Yes, that goes towards my other job as a performing pianist, as an accompanist, or collaborative pianist, as they would call it in America. Which do you prefer? Each term actually does have a problem. Uh, accompanist, <laughs> I, I get it, accompanist sounds a little bit like the subservient. But collaborative pianist, I know, is meant to sound really equal, but it just reminds me of like collaborating with some totalitarian state. Oh, <laughs> I've never thought of it that yeah. way before. See, I'd always said collaborative pianist to sound really like PC. Yeah, it is. It's a nicer <laughs> term, or that's how it's designed. But I, I can't help but hear like I'm a collaborator with the, you know, the corrupt collaborator. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 So um, maybe we need a new term. I don't know, sound wizard or something. Oh, well, if anyone's yeah. got any suggestions, we'd love to hear them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, with accompanying comes a whole another set of challenges yes can you run us through some examples of things that you have to deal with from day to day yeah the accompanist does have an interesting position in that we are there to support the other person but they can't be supported unless they're supporting us at the same time it's very much a mutual thing two-way street very much so there's a sort of illusion that it's about one person leading and the other person following. That's often how people talk about it. But I've never really felt that to be the case when I'm performing. It always feels like we're both mutually predicting the other person's phrasing or whatever. And if two people are imagining in an almost spiritual way, I guess, what the other person is doing, that is the best type of, well, collaboration. It creates a really magical ensemble. And so there are absolutely incredible moments that I can still vividly feel and see where the piece will have a long pause or whatever and the singer has to come in on a on a hard consonant like a B and I just knew when they were going to do it just the way they were not even you don't even necessarily hear their breath you can just feel the way they're thinking yeah it's an invisible yeah. gesture isn't it it really is yeah. yeah that's what I love about it so you have to find that magic with each person yes you have to feel the music yes. together Absolutely. Which I suppose is the, the importance of rehearsal. Yes, or no rehearsal, because actually a lot of the time there isn't any time for... In for, London especially, right? In London <laughs> especially. Well, one of my main jobs every year is playing for the auditions at the college and the academy, which is uh, about two straight weeks, nine to five, you know, singer after singer after singer. They get maybe 10 minutes to warm up and then in for the audition. And they can bring anything, any mm. music at all. Uh, and sometimes you don't get enough time to actually rehearse everything. So the first time you will have ever played some, played the song with them, or maybe sometimes even the first time you've ever played that song ever. Oh wow! Will be in the audition with that person, and so it's not just quick and responsive; it's quick and predictive. You have to be alert to what's about to happen, and then change constantly if that does or doesn't happen. So totally flexible yes. and accommodating but sounding like you're absolutely intended to do it oh absolutely yeah. that's how we live a lot of our lives right exactly yeah fake I it till you make it yeah. yeah i remember actually once i did a horrific audition where they provided an accompanist yeah. and every cellist at this audition was they were all doing the same concertos there's, there's not that many that people choose to do but I don't know if he was really up for the job. Okay, well, for a start, he refused to use anyone's scores that they'd brought. Okay. Got in there, started making up the left hand part to Haydn D. Oh. Didn't really listen or respond. That, to me, is baffling. 
there there are such pianists who exist where they tend just not to listen to the person they're performing with. I mean, there have been times in my life where I might have, you know, missed a cue or something. That Of course, that happens. But it's always my goal. I've got two things I like doing in life. One is playing music and the other is listening to other people play and make music. So as an accompanist, I can do both of those at the same time. It's, yes. a, it's a joy. And especially if someone has a strong musicality, it's it feels inevitable to go with them. Mm-hmm. Yes, you know, if, if someone sings a beautiful phrase and you know when they're going to land on the... On, on your chord or you know you you tee it up so that it's it's magical it's great yeah there are pianists in the world who i guess their goal might just be playing their notes yeah. you accompanied me once i did actually. it was Do a very good that? concert yes. yeah i was at the chelsea and westminster hospital that's right so we did a hospital recital and i remember being really impressed with you actually during the rehearsal oh, very good because <laughs> <laughs> we were rehearsing at your teacher's house mm-hmm. and I was playing something and I played it completely wrong, I remember. And I did what I tend to do is just keep going. That's all you can do. But I looked over at you and I remember you had this face and you had totally clocked what I'd done. (laughs) And it's the kind of face that someone makes if they've swallowed an oyster, but they don't like oysters. (laughs) So when singers and instrumentalists turn up to a rehearsal with you, what can they do? What measures can they take to not piss off their accompanist? (laughs) Well, make them make those faces. I actually did when I was working at college as a as a junior fellow. They now call that the Piano Accompaniment Fellowship. I did actually write this long document that I intended to send to everyone on what you should do. You know, I sent it to the head of department, but I don't. Maybe it was a bit too snarky. He didn't. He didn't like it because <laughs> <laughs> uh, there are lots of things. It it boils down to professionalism in the end. It might be stating the obvious, but do have a copy of the score that the pianist can read. There are too many times where someone will get out scr- like scrunched up bits of loose leaf paper from their bag, which has been photocopied poorly, so the whole bottom line of each page is not visible, so I have no idea what harmony it is or anything. Oh, cool. And it's not like you need your left hand? No. Uh, that's the step step one, really. Have, have a legible score. More advanced than that is I think one thing I always wish people did is really be committed to the way they want to make the music. And the rehearsal happens after that. Often I find people want to discuss it first or you'll sing a phrase and then stop and discuss it or or try to dissect it in advance. Whereas often anything that you discuss that way can be solved automatically by just singing it or playing it the way you want. Just playing it through. Yeah, yeah. committing to the way you want to do it. And then if there's a problem, then you say, oh, I, I missed that entry there or whatever. It's a delicate balance because, you know, you have to figure out how you work with each person, but... Often it's better to start from here's what I want and then we'll collaborate on making that happen. So like commit to that, your initial idea, and then be open to changing things around as they come along. Exactly. I always find that more satisfying musically if you, rather than trying to decide in advance or warn me about every tempo change you're going to take. uh, It's just like a mental overload, isn't it? It is. Yeah. It it can actually confuse both people. Mm -hmm. Better to just do those tempo changes. Yes. And you will pick up because you've got ears and it's your job. (laughs) Yes. That ideally is what happens. Yes. (laughs) I've definitely worked with um, composers before and, you know, before you've even played a note, they're like, right, we're going to put in the dynamics so in this bar, we're going to start piano, <laughs> the crescendo to the next bar to mezzo piano, and you go through the entire yeah. piece just like that. And so you feel like when you finally do play it through, you're just thinking about all the yes. stuff. And that doesn't help you commit to your to your phrasing. A, you could study in decibels every aspect of each phrase and write it down scientifically to get the best, you know, uh, the most perfect phrasing whatever. that won't give you the no. ability to sing it that way yeah uh, again I, I suppose it goes back to um the analogy of someone enunciating every yes. every syllable perfectly but if it's not coming across as an organic phrase it's going to just sound weird isn't it yes and that fra- the word that you just use is great organic if we embrace as much as possible the fact that 90 percent of it is actually just committing to it we do lots of musicological research and study and we learn the style and everything that is all important and then you have to commit to it it's very unnerving when when it's hard to predict where someone's going it's usually because they're thinking too much or or over analyzing it in some way or perhaps waiting for me to lead them mm. or something then you sort of start circling the drain of like 
well, I'll wait for you. And the other person thinks, oh, he's waiting. I'll wait for them. And much better if you are both mutually confident. And take responsibility. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. So I guess there's a lot to be said about going with your gut. Yes, provided you've practiced a lot. <laughs> but, yeah, exactly. Your gut yes. might not be correct yeah. if it's inorganic. <laughs> that's, a, that's a really good point because how do you learn that your instinct is wrong? You can't learn that by repressing it. You've actually got to release that instinct and yes. then discover, oh, that didn't work, actually. <laughs> so it's, it's terrifying. It's a bit of a risk, but you do have to, I think, commit and then reassess. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And be willing to take on some criticism if it's, not, yes. if it's not right. Do you ever come across people who get defensive if you yes. make and certain that, suggestions? That is understandable. I mean, I'm sure I also get a little prickly in that those ways no one really wants to be criticized that's sort of deeply human you do as a especially as a coach working with singers you do have to be able to find a way to offer the criticism in a way that is useful and actionable it's you know classic truism that you never say that's flat you say it could be sharper because yeah. it doesn't help to just be told oh you did that wrong well it's good to be constructive isn't it yes it's to me the the essential part is it, especially if you are criticizing and they say oh okay fine what should i do and you're like well i don't know just fix it well then actually i'm not sure you're entitled to make that criticism you have to have the suggestion as well mm -hmm. in, in my view that's for both parties uh, soloist and uh, pianist to be polite and courteous and uh, yeah. professional even if you've got some critical stuff to say, you know, yeah. it's it helps to remember that any criticism is there for the mutual betterment of your performance. And it's finding a nice way to say it sometimes, yes. isn't it? Yeah. Well, in a in a way that well, I like to think if I was being criticised by something that I was not aware I was doing, how would I like to be yeah. told? You know. Yeah. I find in orchestra especially you get lots of people saying things like. It's probably just me, but <laughs> which is not always helpful because yeah. you just know that that person knows exactly what's yes. going on. But it's being it's being direct, it's being assertive, yes. but not offensive. Yes, I often uh, I guess this is personal taste, but I always find those hedging comments worse because I I think well that's not direct. <laughs> yeah. Better to be direct. I mean, everyone has a different style, of course, but a clear instruction of that sounded bad for this reason. The way to make it better is this. Mm -hmm. And then we try it. And then if it sounds bad, you say, yes, that's what I meant. Yeah. That's kind of a classic model that if the person is willing to go with you, then it, it works. Yeah, it progresses and it improves. Yes. And hopefully yeah. your point was actually right. Yeah. You know, that's another thing you've got to uh, know when your suggestion didn't work. <laughs> That's happened too. You know. And that you're not just suggesting things because you feel like you have to say something. It's important not to simply think of something to say for the sake of it. Yep. It should genuinely be something you really do believe will help them do it better. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for that insight on accompanying. People may know that you are the author of a very uh, successful yes. blog <laughs> called Throw Case. Yes satirical classical music articles yes and i think a lot of listeners may recognize the title of one of your most viral headlines which is student has amazing breakthrough by doing what teacher says <laughs> other memorable ones that stuck out for me 12 ways to reveal you have perfect pitch and singer describes song by singing all of it yes yeah <laughs> Can you tell me, have a lot of these posts drawn inspiration from your experiences? Definitely. The Perfect Pitch one was very cathartic to write because <laughs> uh, all of those examples, I think I can trace to a person doing them. And actually, that was vindicated when I saw the comments on various forums and things. People with Perfect Pitch would, would write a comment saying, I have Perfect Pitch and I'm, I must admit I've done at least half of these. <laughs> And uh, that did go very well. Yes. Yeah. The last point in that post was interesting because it, w it was basically a humble brag. And there is quite a lot of that yes. in our industry. When people say things like, oh, you know, oh, it's really difficult for me <laughs> to listen to this because of my perfect pitch. Yes. Oh, how I suffer. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I'm just, so hard. My, my, my talents make it so much of a burden for me to process all of the, the harmonies. <laughs> or, yeah. We're caught in a bit of a bind, musicians. We have to sell ourselves and big note ourselves that's part of our job and yet it's very easy to lose your way and uh, maybe believe your own press a little too much that's partly the reason i started it was 
there's so much of sort of sense of humor in the classical music world that we don't really see it makes sense audiences want to go and be uplifted by the lofty art and everything when that's great but then if you spend much time with classical musicians you know backstage we have some tensions we've got to release yeah some absolutely. jokes we need to tell you know, about each other and about the world and the way things are. And I think that's why Throwcase is so successful because so many people have read those posts and be like, I know someone exactly yes. like John Mann yes. or I know someone exactly like Sally McNally. And the big one is Max Tenor. I've done a few of him I'm making fun of tenors, basically. At a rehearsal at the college, a tenor came up to me and said, uh, how dare you <laughs> write that about me? And I was like, I, it wasn't about you. It was, it was about someone else. Oh, really? <laughs> and so he's like, oh, okay, fine. Took but personal offence. He thought it, it must have been that I was writing about him. I very much enjoy those posts. And I hope to see more in the future. Yes, well, there might be. There might be some soon. Some, some in the pipeline. When I got married, I stopped writing because it did seem a bit perverse to be trying to plan a wedding and then taking time off to be. <laughs> <laughs> but then, uh, yeah, I just haven't got back, back into it yet. But there are ideas, many, many ideas. Some that I think oh, I could never possibly post that publicly because it would just be too uh, too Specific. scandalous. Yeah, too, yes. too, yes. Yeah. So I thought we could move on two fun questions. Oh, very good. I did tell you that there would be some surprise questions. Yes. I've um, been on the edge of my seat all day. Oh, I'm introducing the wild card question round. Okay. So that this is your chance for you to choose what I ask you next from three choices. Okay. Okay, so first you've got, would you rather finish the sentence or what's on your playlist? I'm curious about finish your sentence. Okay. Fin finish this sentence. Yeah. I will go with that. So finish the sentence, please, Chad. You may not know it to look at me, but I am exceptionally skilled at... Wasting lots of time. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why that was the first thing that came to mind, but yeah. Wasting lots of time. Yeah, there's those YouTube uh, holes that you have to go down and oh. uh, the deep dives into, you know... So you're saying that people must look at you and think you're so productive? <laughs> well, I, I certainly hope they do. It's the well-trimmed yeah. beard, yes. maybe. Yeah, you've got to you've got to <laughs> keep those things ordered. If I leave it go too long, my wife Lisa will say that I'm starting to look a bit homeless. So <laughs> got to keep that keep that in check. So if you did start looking a bit homeless, then people might think, oh. He looks like he's good at wasting time. <laughs> so what kind of things are you watching on YouTube at the moment? What's on your recommended, your homepage? There are a lot of really niche classical music, especially piano music, YouTube pages out there that will post, you know, concertos by people I've never even heard of or random piano pieces that were recorded once and never again. That Those are endlessly fascinating. I always like discovering new music especially if it's 200 years old. But then there are other things, like just recently I got into Alex Honnold, the rock climber. I saw oh, the yes. yes. Yep. I saw the film Free Solo, and I now my, the YouTube algorithm thinks that's all I care about, so it's just hundreds of videos of him climbing seemingly every wall. He is yeah. pretty crazy, isn't he? He's crazy, yeah. and I keep watching him thinking, what can you glean from someone like that? If there is anything, it seems to me to be his practice process is all about imagining what it will be like on the day which is exactly what any of the good practice I've ever done in my life has been that also, where it's not just practicing a move so that you feel better at it on that day. No, no, it's practicing imagining doing that move so that you know on the day that it's psychologically a habit yes. as well as being in your muscle memory. That was crazy because obviously, obviously this is not a spoiler for anyone who yeah. hasn't seen Free Solo. <laughs> uh, he climbs, what, 3,000 feet? 3,000 feet. El and he survives. Capitan, yeah. And he survives because he, he's spoken about his experiences. Yeah. But it's just crazy to think that if he makes one mistake, yeah. it is all over. Yeah. So I suppose that puts our craft into, it does. into <laughs> massive perspective, doesn't it? It really does, yeah. yeah. Uh, especially watching him with his practice journal, with his climbing journal, where he would describe what he'd written. And it was similar, I, I'd like to think, similar to what I was saying before. It was no negativity, no criticism, no you did a bad job. It was always, this is what you should do next yeah. time. This what, is, what can I do better? Yeah. yeah. I loved seeing that approach play out <laughs> in something so terrifyingly dangerous because it, it does work. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And also to have that command over your 
nerves. Yeah, I don't know how that's possible. He he was actively enjoying it, I think, when he like he was having a good time. Yeah. <laughs> being three thousand feet above the ground, dangling he, in the most <laughs> exposed precarious yeah. positions. He caused more stress for the people he filming did. him and yeah. he had to be considerate of that. He couldn't really tell any of the crew or his mm. girlfriend when he was yeah. going to go. Yeah, she had to, he had to send her away so that he could just decide, oh, I'm doing it now. Well, yeah. imagine if we did that as performers. It's like, I'm going to perform sometime my absolute best, <laughs> but I'm not going to tell you when it is. Yeah, not allowed to be And there. if you witness yeah. it, then good for you. Also, I just remember when he gets to the summit and he just goes, I'm so delighted. <laughs> yes, <Yeah>, so delighted. <laughs> Quite pleased. And then, you know, he calls his girlfriend. His girlfriend's just like, overwhelmed with yeah. emotion because oh my god you did it and you're actually alive <laughs> you're <not dead. laughs> i'm not sure he's necessarily someone you can emulate but there's certainly the the basic fact is if you eliminate the sort of mystique out of the practice process if you take the sort of the idea of talent or whatever out of the practice process and then you just get down to the essentials which is can you do the move repeatedly prepare yourself in a way that that move is possible with ease on a specific day you have in mind in the future. That's that's a pretty good thing to, to keep in mind. And especially, actually, I often find a lot of the time people's ideas of, you know, am I, am I good, am I talented or whatever, or am I better than the person who's my colleague or, gets in the way of a clear-minded mm -hmm. approach to, to doing the task. Yeah, That's another throw case. Yes. <laughs> One of the, <laughs> the authors writes a book and his, his big method is do the thing. <laughs> Just, it's a very successful book because, yeah, just do the thing. Do the thing and yeah. you'll be fine. Yeah. It does remind me, of, this is really cheesy, but I was in Oval Tube Station today and I saw one of those inspirational quotes oh, yeah. that you see on the tube sometimes. It's very simple to make something complicated, yeah. but very complicated to make something simple. Yes, Chopin said that. Really? He said, I don't know the exact words, the ultimate simplicity was one that you gained after mastering the complexity. Mm-hmm. And that's a very different type of simplicity to the one before you've yeah. gone through the complexity. And that's the one you should be pursuing. That His idea for practice was that you you should never over-practice. If you over-practice, you'll actually, I think his word was stupefy. Stupefy? Your, yourself. <laughs> like in Harry Potter. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think he, he does use that word or the French version of it. But if you get lost in the complexity, you'll be stupefied. What you have to do is pass through that to get to the simplicity on the other other end where it is just yes here's this move got to simplify not stupefy yes so yes. Chopin's, words from Chauvin, yeah. Chopin's wise words very kindly paraphrased by the staff of Oval Tube yeah. Station <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for doing this today my pleasure um, where can listeners follow you or find you or have you got anything any exciting projects coming out that we can look out for so there's always my website chadvinden.com where you can see two of my favourite performances I've done the uh, seven early songs of Alban Berg and Pierre Lunaire, which was very good. It was a, a staged performance uh, with a fellow Australian, Lottie Betstein. I am very excited of concert in Vienna, the Vienna Biennale. Bayern oh, yes. Biennale. Yeah, Biennale. yeah, like big yeah. festival thing. Yeah, that way, yeah. yeah, I know the word. Yes. I don't know yeah. how to say it. <laughs> <I don't... laughs> uh, yeah, I have a concert there with uh, a very, very good uh, Australian soprano, Alexandra Flood. Uh, that's pretty exciting. This is something... I need to be better at in life is actually knowing my own diary. It's all on my phone, so I can go and look at it. And oh, I can't but, do a phone diary. Yeah. i got to have everything written down. Yeah. Because I think the action, the muscle memory of writing down the task yes. goes into my brain. I 100% believe that and don't act on that uh, at all. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we'll keep everyone up to date with your future pursuits. Thank you very much, Chad Vinden. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed my chat with Chad. I'm introducing now a segment which I hope to incorporate into each episode. It's called Music College Didn't Prepare Me. I'm especially interested in those experiences we have as musicians that we never expect to encounter. It's always pretty entertaining hearing about people's weird gigs and enlightening for non-musos as to what we have to put up with sometimes. So I'll get the ball rolling. Music College didn't prepare me for that time I had to perform Schubert's Death in the Maiden String Quartet on a cruise ship. We were sailing, and therefore performing, in high winds in the Bay of Biscay. 
which, if you don't know, is totally notorious for seasickness and motion. It's a little coasty corner of France and Spain. That's the technical term for it. I had to deal with my music sliding around the stand, my cello unexpectedly coming up to meet my bow, or my bow not landing on my string when I wanted it to. It was like having a weird sense of weightlessness. You know the pirate ship ride at theme parks, where you just sit on a thing and it just swings back and forth like a pendulum? It's like that, but imagine you're also playing a very challenging piece of string quartet repertoire at the same time. Anyway, having to negotiate the tiny little dots on the page is like reading in the car for me. It never ends well. I got through my performance. I packed away my cello and stumbled my way to the bathroom where I promptly vomited. Ugh. So now it's your turn. Email me at asitcomespodcast at gmail.com. Just start your story with Music College Didn't Prepare Me For and you could feature in a future episode. That's it for today. Enormous special thanks to Rosalia Nagy for my logo. She's a graphic designer based in Amsterdam. Check out her work at rosnagy.net. That's R-O-Z-Z-N-A-G-Y.net. And to composer Daniel Elms for my jingle. Dan's album just released last week. I went to a bit of his album launch. I missed the beginning, unfortunately because the trains just totally sucked that day. But from what I heard, his music is just so beautiful and hypnotic. His album is called Islandia. It's out on New Amsterdam Records. Check out his work at danielelms.co.uk and follow him on Instagram at danielelmsmusic. I've got to say, I have a newfound respect for people who can come up with such excellent results with only a totally rando brief from me to go by. Make me a logo. Make it look cool. Write me a jingle. Make it not naff. <laughs> it's an incredible skill to have. Thanks also to Chad for being an excellent guest. It's always such a pleasure to hang out with Chad and his wife, Lisa. We always end up eating and drinking quite a lot and having wonderful conversation. And finally... Thank you so much for listening. As you know, it's my first episode, so do let me know what you think. You can email me at asitcomespodcast at gmail.com. Follow the podcast on Facebook and Instagram at asitcomespod. And if you like what you hear, rate and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts and spread the word. I'll chat to you guys soon. Bye. Bye.